Welcome back to Coppers and Brass and thank you very much for joining us again. A series of programmes looking at various issues of Irish traditional music that I think don't often get aired in public as much as they should. Today's programme is about the work of Nipibri Yellen and I'm delighted to say that we have the Chief Executive of Nipibri Yellen, Gay McKeown, along with us. Gay, you're very welcome. Thank you for telling me. And we'll be coming back to Gay shortly uh, to discuss the role of Ellen Piping and the role of his organisation in Irish traditional music. We'll also be taking a trip down to the Cobblestones again for our weekly session uh, where we're joined by some of the finest musicians in the country. But in the meantime, let's have a look at this. In 1960, a small number of musicians concerned about the future of Ellen Piping formed a society, Nipibri Ellen, with the aim of preserving and perpetuating Ellen Piping and pipe making. From humble origins, it has grown into a vibrant professional organisation which has developed strategies and programmes in which the original vision of its founders is central to everything it does. Today there are over 4,000 members worldwide, 2,000 in Ireland, who are involved in all aspects of piping. Lessons are its primary means of maintaining the tradition. Each week, experienced players teach young pipers in small groups, focusing on a specific tune. Lessons are held in NPU headquarters, as well as in local schools around Dublin. Students who express an interest in trying the pipes are often assisted by the club's loan scheme, whereby practice sets are provided on loan for up to one year. The tutor breaks down the tune into manageable parts for the pupils to commit to memory. For decades, the craft of pipe making had been seriously neglected, with demand for pipes outstripping supply. Even today, waiting lists of up to 10 years for a set of pipes from the most popular pipe makers is not uncommon. NPU has provided a custom-built, state-of-the-art workshop. Staffed with skilled tradesmen offering apprenticeships to aspiring young pipe makers to meet the incessant demand for quality pipes. NPU's mission of preserving Ireland's premier traditional art form embraces the most modern of technologies to reach out to pipers in 40 countries worldwide. The club's comprehensive website offers dozens of services to its members, and most of the facilities on the site are free to non-members as well. Lessons are available online at beginners, intermediate and advanced levels, and slowers. With thousands of students studying Irish traditional music worldwide, well-researched and documented archive material is in huge demand. This aspect of the club site is user-friendly, easy, accessible and extremely comprehensive. NPU TV broadcasts programmes on performances from many venues, including Henrietta Street, the Cobblestones Bar and other venues. A range of piping materials for the enthusiast, including pipe making and maintenance, manuscript collections, 
and audio and video collections is available at the shop in Henrietta Street and online. The club plays a pivotal role in the annual Willie Clancy Week, which attracts hundreds of pipers amongst the thousands of visitors from across the world. Experienced members travel throughout the world giving lessons, recitals and performances throughout the year to maintain standards and reinforce the values of great piping. Well, that was just a very brief overview of some of the wide range of activities that the Peabreal uh, get involved throughout the year, every year. Gay, an exhausting programme there. It takes a lot to, to, get, to get all that up and running. But before we come to the detail of that, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your own involvement in traditional music before you came to the post that you're in now? Sure. Um, my father was from County Leitrim and uh, my mother from County Clare. And they, whereas they didn't play music or didn't sing, they, they had a great love of traditional music. And my father heard Leo Rosam great piper, pipe maker and broadcaster and teacher uh, when my father was quite young and he fell in love with the sound of the pipes and a number of years later he befriended Leo Rossum and my eldest brother Tomas went to classes with le weekly lessons with Leo in the School of Music and in the Pipers Club here in Dublin and uh, I tried the piano to, <laughs> with a lot of success I think I, bro I broke the hearts of so many teachers but uh, Leo suggested me, I used to go into the classes and Leo suggested me I might take up the pipes so I did and Leo was huge, very, very, very encouraging and um, I didn't have a lot of faith in my own ability but Leo mm -hmm. certainly showed a lot of faith in me and encouraged me greatly and that was really it and uh, you know then I just really got involved more and more, particularly in my teenage years after Leo died, I had no teacher really and I kind of learned on my own, I got a few lessons here and there and I got a lot of support from people like Matt Kiernan, Dan O'Dowd, Sean Seary, people like that, Tommy Reck. They were very supportive and there was an, a small community of Villain Pipers but a very um, a, a, a very close and supportive group of people. Mm -hmm. So um, Brendan Brunock then, um, I got, you know, got to know Brendan and got involved with the Peabreal and I've been involved with the Peabreal and in fact, at the, you know, since the very beginning, uh, I was there with my, my parents, my, my dad and my brother and uh, my father had a keen interest, he, whereas he didn't play, he supported mm -hmm. the pipe making particularly because he was he did join me workshops and stuff like that. So I've been involved in piping all my life and um, my family, my mm -hmm. children are involved in music, my so wife. You, <coughs> you've been involved as a pupil, as a volunteer and now in a professional capacity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what is the state of piping now? Is, it, uh, is the demand for piping beginning to tail off? No, it's, it's growing. Uh, like, I mean, nobody could have believed in 1968 that the, the growth in, in terms of the geographic spread and the numbers of, of players. So um, that's just continuing. Uh, we're amazed. I think people just find it difficult to know where to get a set of pipes. And mm. if you get a set of pipes, then they find it difficult to get a teacher. And if they find it, if they can do those two things, then they need to be in the community mm. of pipers to keep the mm. pipes going and to learn. So the job in the people Island is just to try and do the basics of promoting the playing and making of the Island pipes. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a big, big increase. Like we've over a hundred instruments out in loan on a continuous basis. And we're finding about 75% of those people go on and buy their mm -hmm. own instruments. So it is creating a demand for instruments, but we're doing training as well in their pipe craft training centre. There's a lot of new makers here in Ireland have come to the you know uh, uh, come to the fore in recent years and uh, the situation is improving. You can you know you, you you know things are improving so in terms of accessibility of tuition of instruments mm -hmm. and of teach you know of, of classes. So you know there's a it takes a lot of work uh, Tommy you mm -hmm. know but uh, gradually we're making I believe we're making you know good inroads and we're just uh, mm -hmm. you know we're very focused. And um, I suppose one of the ways you can gauge its, its popularity is attendance at classes, particularly at the Willie Clancy Week. How were the numbers this year? Yeah, we've just come from it and uh, de definitely this year there was a significant increase in, of, in the ge in, you know, geographic spread of the participants in the classes and also the age profile. An awful lot of young people and particularly mm -hmm. the demographics in relation to female uh, young girls and 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 uh, if, uh, women generally playing the and pipes, which is significant. And uh, we think we'll need to put on more classes next year at that, and and our, at all our classes, outreach classes around the country and abroad that we're involved with, and indeed our own weekly classes in Henry Street. Mm -hmm. 
we're inundated with people that want to learn. So yes, there is very, very su significant and sustained growth, you know, of interest in the in, in the instrument. That's for sure. It's it's an expensive instrument, though. Is that not a bit prohibitive for some people? <laughs> well, it is in theory. People kind of balk and they hear the big figures, you know. Like I mm -hmm. mean, if you're to buy a high end set of Illum pipes, you can pay a lot of money. But mm -hmm. to get an entry level set of Illum pipes, it does it. Uh, you know, there's an active second-hand market. Well, first of all, in the people and have a pipes and loan scheme, and we're always adding to the inventory of instruments we have. We have over 100 sets in loan, and we want to add to that. How does that work? Uh, well, basically, people contact uh, their. Well, if it's a young person, the, their their parents, their guardians need to contact the people and register the interest. Um, and what we try and do is make a set available to people for a year. Does it? They. they there's no rental charge, but there is a, a, a refundable deposit, uh, mm -hmm. just to make sure that the instrument comes back to us and that it's you know it's not you know beyond you know beyond repair or anything mm -hmm. like that. So, and that's never really the case. Uh, as, uh, so basically, and we ask that people join the people room so as to be in the community. So mm -hmm. if you're a child that's 25 euro, an adult 50 euro, and then you're in the network and you get a you know you get a discounts, and we ask that people. Uh, sorry, discounts on our materials, and mm -hmm. you know, so it's 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 makes good economic sense to join, and then also uh, we ask that people have access and act actually do get lessons because there's no point in having an instrument without mm -hmm. getting lessons, you know. So mm -hmm. um, that that that's how that works. Mm -hmm. So basically, people can get an instrument on loan or from the people, or maybe from somebody they know mm -hmm. might loan them a set mm -hmm. of pipes. And you can, for about a thousand euro, you can get a good practice set of pipes, maybe 1200 euro, mm -hmm. get a good practice set of pipes that last you forever and you can add onto them, add drones onto them and, and time add, add regulations so you get a full mm -hmm. set of pipes. So it's kind of, you start with a beginner set, entry level and so isn't so costly and you'll find that the people find that the community of Ireland pipers are pretty generous and supporting right. people, mm -hmm. you know, so. Uh, we would like to think that the uh, cost would, wouldn't be a barrier. Shouldn't be a, a, if barrier. someone's really determined yeah, to get involved. Yeah. And anybody who's interested, just contact us and we'll okay. see. We'll try and do everything in our power to help. You know. Okay. I want to talk to you in a second about um, about the instrument itself, its origins and, and it, 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 its current state. It's a very yeah. technically advanced instrument compared to some, some other instruments. But before the, we do that, we want to take a trip back across the Liffey again to the Cobblestones uh, Bar in Dublin. Um, for our weekly sessions, and I'm delighted uh, that I've been joined uh, on this occasion by a fellow northerner, Vinton Valley from Armagh, um, playing A Dear Irish Boy. Hey, Vinton Valley, I'm going to play a tune which um, I learnt uh, from Felix Dorn at, at the Flan in Scorfia, I think 1967 or 69 or something, and um, a troubled version of the Dear Irish Boy.
always Vinton Valley with a version of a Dear Irish Boy, uh, a tune also favoured by Pipers. Gay, yeah, um, just before the break for, for Vinton's tune there, we were talking about the actual set, the instrument itself. Uh, could you give us a brief background of when it was developed, how it was developed, and particularly do you see any further developments or has it, has it reached its zenith? Yeah, uh, well, obviously, the, the Ilham Pipes emerged from, I suppose, a simple mouth-blown instrument that was used mainly in battle mm -hmm. and for, for sporting occasions and developed into pastoral pipes in the, the 1700s and then into the current manifestation of bag bellows, chanter and three drones and three regulators um, in the early 1800s. And different stages, people have uh, experimented with, with, with different ideas, using different materials, uh, you know, maybe adding on extra drones or extra regular mm -hmm. regulators, you know. So uh, I, that has continued and it's beco become more prevalent, like people are adding on A drones or uh, maybe some mm. extra regulator keys. Um, I don't know if they're going to change significantly. I think the materials that are used, uh, mm -hmm. people are looking at different, you know, using spruce for making reeds and, uh, you know, different metals for making reeds. Um, but in, in the main, I think the instrument is pretty where it pretty much at where it's going to mm. be, I mm -hmm. think. Um, I mean, you can get a chromatic chanter you can, with all the keys, you, you know. There has been a fair amount of innovation over the last 20 years, and certainly the skills of pipe makers have been, you know, honed, uh, going back to the kind of skill levels that, funnily enough, that mm. existed in pre-famine times, you know. Mm. So uh, we've been catching up and trying to reclaim the skills of, of pipe I, makers. I was just wondering, um, uh, I've certainly been, been conscious of an increase of the pipes being used in other forms rather than traditional music. It's sure. become a popular different. And I wonder if the demand, if the pipes begin to reach out beyond mm. the traditional Irish music, would that affect the development? No, I just it? think that people are realising that it's an excellent instrument mm. and could, you know that it can be applied in different uh, to musical different music genre, uh, and and um, so that's what's happening. But I don't yeah. think the in inherent instrument itself is okay. changing significantly. I hope not, because I'm struggling with <laughs> getting on top of what we have. <laughs> right, makes two of us, Tommy. Styles, uh, styles in Irish traditional music has been a hotly contested yeah. subject and defining styles. We haven't the time, unfortunately, yeah, to sure. do it here today. But what's your overview on, is there a single style of pipe playing or is it the old mm. closed and open or what's the state of styles in Ilham pipe playing? Yeah, well, it's, it's funny, I've often reflected on this, why you say flute players and fiddle players particularly, you get the regional styles and not so much in Ilham pipe. And mm -hmm. I think partially the reason is that the pipers tended to gravitate towards the cities and I think mm -hmm. that may have been because the materials were mainly imported uh -huh. and the pipe makers operated there and because of the nature of the instrument it's not so easy to take it up so you tended to have st uh, styles of, that were passed on from whoever taught you know the next generation so mm -hmm. they tend to be uh, focused on individuals you know mm -hmm. so I think that the you know that uh, and the extremes funny of open and tight playing, you're using very staccato uh, features of the chant, of the particularly the chanter, mm. um, and the more legato, you know, open style, more closer, closer in some ways to flute playing. I don't think the it's extreme now as it used to be. I think mm. most pipers actually use a, a blend of both. Mm -hmm. So I think that's been a, a you know a more significant development. And to my mind, it's probably you know um, you know. Either extreme is probably in itself is is, is, is interesting, there. but you know it can be you know it blocks out some aspects that could be used mm. uh, you know uh, in both. So I think the majority of pipers now tend to use kind of a very blended approach, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's possibly a good thing. Mm. You know, um, so no, I don't see significant changes in that regard. Um, a healthy mixture of both. Yeah, I think, I think so. so yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Well, finally, Gay, um, what about the future? What about the future of piping? What about the future of Nipibri Ilan? Yeah. Um, will there be a demand for Nipibri Ilan for decades to come? Um, yeah, well, it's, the ironic thing is that more of more work we do, we find that, mm. we, that we have more actually to do. The interest in Ilan piping is quite phenomenal and it's just very difficult for people. We're doing a lot of outreach teaching in Ireland and abroad and we see that the demand is there, people are really fascinated and it's not really 
because of Nepe Brielle and or anybody in the organization. It's the sound of the instrument. Mm. The instrument so is it's the it's ambassador. It, it, yeah, yeah. So mm. people hear it in the soundtracks to films or they hear the you know, go to hear the chief and so go to river dance, they hear recordings of Johnny Doran or Leah Rosen or James Dennis, whoever. And it's that's what it brings them to mm -hmm. the people really. and so uh, I, I think we've tons of work to do in the basics of just teaching people how to play and people teaching people how mm -hmm. to make the instrument and I think that um, I, I, I actually think that the potential and the interest in it is we're only scraping we're only scraping yeah. the tip of the iceberg in honesty I, I honestly think in 20 30 years time that we will see a massive proliferation of villain piping around the world I really do. To maintain the, the level of activities that we saw in the little documentary there uh, requires huge resources. Sure. Um, are you funded centrally by government or are you the uh, we, 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 Well, there's a number of areas. We get, uh, uh, thankfully, we get funding from the Arts Council as an organisation. We get uh, some funding from Dublin City Council. Uh, we get a, a little bit from the, we get some from the Crafts Council. We're very happy. Different agencies work with us and like lead or help us on the uh, pipe making by funding pipe uh, you know, trainees. Uh, so there's very various different ways. Obviously, our own members and their membership and uh, subscriptions. Uh, then when they buy, when people buy things on our website, we make mm -hmm. hopefully make a bit of a profit. So there's a number of different sources. Um, um, that's terribly important to us. Uh, we couldn't really function at the level that mm -hmm. we do. We see that the demand is huge and uh, ever expanding, and we work harder and smarter, I think. And we're very process driven and we're, we're IT savvy, I think. So we just try to, you know, get more results mm -hmm. with the same, you know, li with the same limited resources and, and, and try and do our job. We're going to be building, uh, reinstating 15, uh, sorry, 16 Henrietta Street. We're, we're based at 15 Henrietta Street and that building was subdivided and then 16 fell down. So we're going to put a museum theatre, a museum theatre, um, a, a visitor centre and then a expanded Fantastic. archive. And mm -hmm. that's going to be a national Illin Piping Centre and like, uh, why wouldn't we, get, uh, along with the harp, the, you know, the, the, the Ilan Pipes is very iconic of Ireland. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, lots of countries have mm -hmm. ba bagpipe museums and we don't have uh, an Ilan Piping Centre. So we, we believe that this, there's a great demand for this and that it'll be a great asset to Ireland and to, the, to Dublin and to the internationally people who want to come and learn about the Ilan Pipes. So we're doing a fundraising campaign uh, over the next number of years, a capital campaign to put those things in place. And then um, we're looking forward to getting on with okay. it. Well, Gia, as one of your uh, least distinguished but most enthusiastic pupils, I want to thank you on behalf of Pipers the worldwide, not just Pipers, but yeah. those who enjoy pipes. Uh, and the Peabody Island does fantastic work. There is clearly a major role for it ahead. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank and you, good luck with all your Thanks successful very much. endeavors. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Well, that was Gia McKeown and the wonderful work of the Peabody Island. And um, I think you'll agree with me from the short interview we've had and uh, look at the, some of the work up in the schools and in the community, they are doing really fantastic work. That brings us to the end of this particular programme on uh, Coppers and Brass. Next week we're um, having the focus on a family of traditional music, the Mulligan family, um, Tom Mulligan who owns the Cobblestones and his, and his brothers and sons, daughters, nephews and nieces are like many other big families in Dublin keeping the tradition on. So we're going to have a look at, at them and what they're doing. And we'll also be going back to the cobblestones for a few tunes. In the meanwhile, thanks very much for joining us and I do hope to see you again next week. <laughs>